It is rolling. I, yeah, I, I see the I see the dot now. Okay. Mm. Just as my my Ken Bauer annotation says, ladies and gentlemen, we are recording this session, so do understand that anything that you say or if you choose to be on camera will be recorded in the session and may be used for Flip Learning Network purposes. We do, however, respect your privacy as individuals and wish to respect your wishes. Do understand you're being recorded. Product not as actually viewed. Okay. <laughs> No, no refunds at this time. Sure. Oh, Full refund man. either way. Anyway, yeah. so um, these, these are the folks that have uh, agreed to kind of help out and answer questions. Um, what, a whole bunch of, I'll let everybody introduce themselves, um, but I, I'm Katie Lanier. I live in Allen. I've been flipping, I think, for almost 10 years. And I think if you, if, if you recognize some of these names, there's over 50 years of flipping up there. So, and, and that was amazing when I thought of it that way. Um, and uh, so I, my, I, I flipped physics, so high school, college, and then I've done some instructional coaching and worked as an administrator to help other, other teachers flip. So we'll let, let's see. Ken, you wanna go next? Um, next. Um, so I think I've been flipping for seven or eight years. I can't remember. Um, and I met a bunch of you for the first time about six years ago, FlipCon. 2014 in Mars, Pennsylvania, and then I went to the one in um, Michigan, and then we had the one in Texas, and Katie was such a gracious host, and uh, that's the last FlipCon we did as the FLN and various flip decks since then, and I'm currently the chair of the board of directors of the Flip Learning Network for the past four years, looking for some of the takeover. More news about that hopefully soon. I won't disappear. I'll continue to be active but I think it's time to pass the torch eventually. And I will mention people that are interested in being involved. Um, it is an all volunteer network. None of us are paid. Um, and you don't have to be on the board to do stuff. And we, we have projects on the go. The newsletter is available if anyone wants to get involved in that. Um, but you don't have to be on a board to do stuff. But if you want to, you should talk to us because we're always looking to do some rotation of people on the board and, and give people some more space to, uh, experiment. And I'm a computer science professor, associate professor here in Guadalajara, Mexico, at the Tecnológico de Monterrey. Uh, so welcome, bienvenidos. I will also tag on to Ken. I am Matthew from Illinois. I teach math. I am actually switching math teaching jobs after 20 years to a different district just because there's such a great opportunity for implementing some real change during this time where people really want it. And that's really at the heart of this conference. It was making teaching work in 2020. And so that's kind of the heart of what we're up to here. And it does reflect uh, the mentality of the Flip Learning Network. We're just a bunch of folks helping a bunch of folks. That, that's it. So uh, nothing really more complicated than that. And that's why we hosted this one for free and we hope to do the next one as long as the lights stay on. So that, that works out for us. All right, I'm out. I'll go next. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Baker. I uh, flipped ninth grade English for seven, eight years uh, when I was in the classroom. But um, I talked for 20. And I realized when I found the Flip Learning Network uh, about seven, eight years ago, it was actually able to give a name to what I was doing in the classroom space with my students. Um, for a long time, I felt that it was just like, I was different, I was weird from everyone at my district because I was doing student-centered and doing things in a, in a different way with direct instruction. And I never had a name for it until I found uh, the Flip Learning Network and the Flip Class Chat on Twitter that takes place on Monday nights. So a little plug there for the chat. Uh, I taught freshman English for 20 years and I transitioned out of the classroom last year to work in ed tech full time. And I'm now the senior community engagement manager at Edmodo. And so I've taken all those instructional skills and now apply them to flipping professional development as I work with educators around the world. So I'm also a board member of the Flip Learning Network, so happy to be with all of you here today and looking forward to staying connected as we continue our flipping journey. Um, I'll go next. My name is Bob Furlong, and I am a science teacher. I am in uh, Ohio, just south of Toledo in the northwest Ohio corner. 
doing for five years now. Um, started with my honors biology class and have done it with uh, a, um, a general biology class, uh, my anatomy and physiology class. I teach AP biology as well. And um, one thing that I will say is I flip each class differently. So, you know, I, I still use kind of like the 101 version of flipping with my honors class, but with my general biology class, because of the, uh, you know, the, the student population that's in there, I do an in-class flip with them uh, where they don't have to worry about doing any homework, which they absolutely love, by the way. And so uh, I'm, every class that I'm, that I'm teaching is being flipped a little bit differently. Well, and that makes complete sense, and that's why we love having you here. Is because that's that's what you want. Is it's set up for your for class and your kids? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm the only person on the slide who hasn't introduced themselves. So I'm jo I'm Joy. I work in Toronto, actually a suburb of Toronto in Canada. And I started flipping in 2013. My principal took a handful of us to see some flippers at another school. And one of them mentioned Crystal Kirch. So I was all over her blog and she got me connected to Flip Class Chat and Flip Class Chat just has led to so many other things. Um, I am a math and science teacher. My background is in chemistry and physics. And I, I actually have not yet flipped an entire course. So I have flipped lessons, I have flipped the odd unit, but I haven't got a whole course done yet. So I feel in some ways as if I am still in some ways a new flipper, but I've, I've learned a lot along the way and I'm happy to share what I know. And I've tried some, some mastery stuff. I've tried some gamification and there's just so much to dig into in the world of flip learning, but you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Roxana. Uh, my camera is not working for some reason. Um, I work as a, a ESL teacher at this moment. I'm a language teacher and teach Spanish in New Jersey. And um, I've been introduced to flip, uh, flip in the classroom many years ago, but I never actually uh, got deep inside and find out exactly what it is. So today is like a first time I'm going to learn a lot. So thank you for this opportunity and nice to meet you all. And if everybody else would follow Roxana's lead and put their, um, their place and their role in education in the chat window, that would be great. And that way we also can take on our first question. Now, Roxana, you mentioned that this is literally like your first kind of, um, the first time you really got into this. What's something you want to know? Well, uh, the way that I can engage my students as much as possible because I'm trying different strategies and I have such a diverse community. So I need different strategies for reach every single one. So I think this is gonna be one of the ways that I can, uh, I guess, um, support my idea and figure out a new plan for this year. Can you hear me? Yes, yes yep. Roxanna, yep. remind okay. us your specialty. Um, I'm a language teacher, so I teach Spanish and ESL at this moment. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So what, what I had in mind, but it's, it is not the, the beyond end all of anything, so we can, we can actually wander off if it makes sense. Um, just use the little hand raising thing or, or wave around, unmute yourself um, if you want to um, ask a question. Um, you can put it in the chat if you're not wanting to speak or not sure how to, you know, make all that work because uh, Matt's watching the chat. Um, but I was kind of trying to keep things a little topical so the questions feed each other, but like I said, not necessary. Um, but I thought I'd start with, uh, from our panel group, uh, one big thing, and I, I'm going to say keeping it to one is a challenge until we start repeating each other. So it might, <laughs> it might end up being your two big things. So you, you're meeting a flipper for the first time. What do you want to tell them? And um, I'm just going to go in the order of who's up here on my screen, which is different than everybody else. So uh, Joy, guess what? What's, what is your one, if you can keep it to one big thing? 
Okay, well, my one big thing came up, I, is it, I coined a term in flip class chat probably about a year and a half ago, uh, don't perfastinate. And perfastination is perfection, per, sorry, perfectionism based procrastination. So when you learn about flipping and you hear about all these ideas of how you could flip, you, you get overwhelmed, right? And you think, oh my goodness, this is so tough. Like, and you want to try and, if you're like me, um, I'm not a jump right in person usually, but you want to like know all the things. Um, don't try to know all the things. It's impossible. I don't know all the things. Nobody here knows all the things. Just try something and start with it. And even if that means that you're flipping once a week or you flip the beginning of a unit or a key lesson in a unit, just try it and you will grow from there. And like learning figure skating or riding a bike, you are going to fall down a few times. Like I'm sure all of us who are experienced flippers, if we look back to our herbs, probably shudder because they, they aren't the best at the beginning, but you will grow. And so you have to start somewhere, uh, find out where that is, and just jump in and try it. And your, your students will appreciate your efforts and you will grow from there. Bob, you want to share something? Uh, I thing? would, yeah, just kind of piggybacking off of Joy, I would say, you know, start small. You know, I had four different classes that I was teaching and I just chose the one that I taught the most. I also... Um, because I thought I'm just going to dive into the deep end <laughs> and, but I started, uh, in March of the, uh, in the spring before I started flipping. So I gave myself a six month leeway to start making some videos. And, you know, my goal at that time was to make one uh, video every week. And so that when school started, I would have a, a library full of videos ready to go. Um, and then but, you know, does everyone have to start like that? Certainly not. You know, maybe start with a single unit because you also have to think about, okay, if I just, like in my case, I freed up 50 days of instructional time. What am I going to do in those 50 days? So that, uh, you know, so I said, start taking a look at, well, what can I do in that time that's engaging for the students? And, um, and yeah, I mean, my advice to everybody that has asked me about this is, is start small. Thank you. Kate, you want to chime in? I didn't forget to unmute myself there. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Uh, I want to um, reiterate a bit of what Joy and Bob say in the sense that keep your design simple. Like, don't try to over design your video. Don't try to over design lesson. Like, just keep it real simple, streamlined. Your screencasts don't have to be anything crazy. Uh, you know, we're not Hollywood, so we're not going to do like, you know, crazy special effects and everything. And the simplicity of the design uh, and the, of the, both the learning and how you're um, developing that for your students and structuring it for your students is really, really important. Because you want to think about your time, because you're going to have three ways that you, time is going to be impacted with flip class. Your creation of your videos, your creation of your learning activities, the actual implementing of those activities, and then the scoring of whatever you're gonna do with your formative assessments. So if you make your design too complex, that's gonna eat into your time. And now, you know, you're going to, you know, we oftentimes think about quantifying our lessons in terms of our class period, but we really need to add the prep and the post lesson time into that learning cycle to quantify all that. And the more you keep it simple, the more time you will have to implement and execute on those things. Excellent. Ken, you wanna to add to that? Your yeah, thing? you know, I don't know what Kate has against technology and doing fancy stuff with her <laughs> video, but. Um, Not fancy. I, I was just recording a video about how to use OBS Studio to change your webcam to do fancy stuff this morning. It'll go up soon. Um, so piggybacking a little bit on, on what the others have said, I would say you really need to be convinced that you're changing. And um, Bob says start simple. And some of us start simple. Some of us just go all, 
all in and 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 we've done surveys on that and I, I went all in and to I think it was Melinda asked a question about how to start which class to attack I think mm -hmm. it was yeah which class and my answer would be don't start with like a new class for you <laughs> do something that you're familiar with uh, because you need a lot of confidence in your material because you're not going to control the pace of things so much when you're doing flip learning it's more student-centered and you don't want to um, have too many of those I don't know but I'll get back to you next class type of answer um, there's nothing wrong with that but you want to be comfortable in the material you're doing at first mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say, given that you know you're comfortable with all the materials you're giving or courses, um, I'm, I'm badly translating Spanish to English, even though English is my first language. Uh, you want to probably choose the one that you want to change the most. That's the the most painful, and and I think attack that one. The, the mm -hmm. most uh, impactful change you can make would be my answer to go straight to Melinda's. I've got lots of other ones, but I, I wanted to touch on Melinda's question there. You know, Ken, um, one of the reasons why I chose my uh, biology class first was is the one that I had been teaching the longest. And I already had, you know, PowerPoints already made from previous years of lectures. So that took out that time that requirement time, of having to create lesson. something yep. because I just used all my PowerPoints from the previous years. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yep. Matt, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I will chime in on that one. That's Interestingly, good. I started a little differently. My whole goal was to prove that flip learning didn't work because Ooh. I was the gatekeeper for all of the laggards. And so I chose my biggest pain in the butt class that was the most entitled, that was the most lethargic, the most apathetic. And because I was stacking the deck in the end, it worked out the best because what I saw was a big change in those apathetic, lethargic and transient students. And I don't mean low performing. These were the high performers that they didn't want to change. They don't need to change. Just give me my A. I'm just here for my A because I'm off to my thing. Um, and so now part of it is my personality but i go for the trouble spot first and so by starting in a in a tough position i think katie you said it in a previous session what can go worse yep yeah i went i went with the i couldn't possibly break this more um yeah we we had a we had a, a mandate from the the state that all students in their junior or senior year, we're going to have to take physics at an algebra two level and then pass a uh, state test over it. That's all students. That's students that hadn't passed algebra yet, students that hadn't made it through chemistry yet, and they're going to do basically an honors level physics class with a high stakes test in, in the way of graduation. There was no stress there, and we were we were running with people that were choosing to take the lowest level of physics probably a 20 to 30% failure rate in some of the classes. So how, how could you break that more? That has got to be the worst situation ever. So it's like, okay, we had a chemistry teacher who tried it on our campus and I've watched her for a little while and a week before she presented data and that, you know, that little week before school starts where you get bombarded with all that information. I got bombarded with, there's an entire school in Michigan with a failure rate of, you know, 70% in algebra that dropped it down to 20 by flipping. I was like, well, there's no excuse not to do this. So that first week I flipped the, the physics for my class. And probably my big thing was I talked to my uh, teaching partner. We had a whole team of eight. Not everybody was in, but, but I talked, I talked the one person that I was working with most closely um, into flipping with me. And so the two of us were sharing the load. And so we, we shared the bumps and shared the load. And um, two of us went to the administration, two of us, and there was two of us. So it was, it was always easier and better. Um, we, both did, we both did the videos uh, and, and things only improved. And probably fun story is there was at least one person in our audience that was at the high school in some of the classes during their first flip and knows, knows my family well enough to know my daughter who was in flip classes and probably how how the effect of time on my family when my kids were in high school 
<laughs> and we were trying to flip. So there, there's some other side of the expertise there. It does take a lot of time. And you really, you really kind of have to, all of us here are still changing things. I, I don't know any of us that you're looking at in this panel that are like, oh, well, it took two years, but it's all done. No, no, I've been doing this for 10 and I'm still doing different things because it's what makes sense, what's new and what fits my class best. I know Bob was mentioning that same piece. He does one class this way and another class that way. Joy is still trying to find exactly what's gonna work and I bet it changes every other day. And, and so, you know, we're, we're all still trying to change things up. So I guess that'd be the, did we, anybody else? Shall we, anybody have any questions? Let me get rid of this screen here. Do we have any questions yet? We do not have any specific questions in the chat. Oh, Actually, how does in-class flipping. flipping work? That's a great one. I love Who that. wants it? See, Bob was doing an in-class flip, right? I can talk you, Robert, yeah, right? I can talk you through how I do mine. Um, so the in-class flip, everything is done in the class. You know, so I had a, I had a group of at-risk students in my general biology class. And these were kids that hated school. Uh, they, have, they have all sorts of uh, other issues outside of the school that interferes with their learning. And so I knew that the way that I was flipping my honors class was not gonna work with this group. And so I simply created a, uh, a Google site and I put, uh, it was like a, sort of a sequential order of things where like first you're going to watch this video, then you're going to meet, uh, or you, you're going you're to do this uh, activity, then you're going to meet with me, uh, and then at the end of every lesson, which uh, the way I had it set up was a lesson might have, there might be five activities, you know, two videos, a worksheet, a review, whatever, and then they do a progress check and they have to uh, they have to pass that progress check before they can go on to the next lesson. So what that ended up doing was, it, it, it sounds crazy, but you have kids at different points in their learning. So if a, if a kid was absent, it really didn't affect where they were, they just picked up right where they left off. Um, but for the most part, they all kind of stayed close together uh, in, in terms of where they were at. So it, it sounds like I got kids doing all these different things, which is true, but they also, um, you know, they, they could find a partner that was doing the same thing that they were. And, and so they were, they were constantly flipping groups with one another. And it, it, I mean, it, it, again, it, it sounds like it's crazy, but the, the one nice thing about having that website was I can see exactly where they were at. Uh, we had checkpoints where they had to meet with me so I could have just these tiny little micro discussions with, with each kid as they were going on. And that was kind of how, that how my day went was just going from group to group, checking in. It was a very different way of teaching. But, uh, you know, one of the best things was this was a, in, a, in Ohio, this is a class that has a test that you have to pass to graduate. And um, every child passed except for one. Uh, and she only missed it by like two points. <laughs> so uh, wow. she ended up eventually passing the test the following year. But uh, I never would have thought that I would have had 95% of those kids passing because they, they absolutely hated school. And it, it took several weeks for them to come around to why I was doing this. And what they realized was uh, that there's someone that really cares about me and wanting me to do well. And once they realized that, uh, it totally changed the whole class perspective. I mean, it was, it was amazing to see that, that change that took place. But everything's done in class, pure and simple. That's the in-class flip. One of the nice things about the in-class flip is if you have a, a group that you would worry about access outside of school time, then you're still providing the content in class. Um, but you do get that differentiation of pace. Uh, or if you have a group where you're really, you know that you're going to be fighting with them to, I mean, everybody asks, what if they don't watch the videos? And there are strategies to deal with that and have accountability for watching the videos. If you have a group that you know it's just going to be 
lots of accountability and and you might want to just kind of bypass that then in class flip can just just be a management system for that too I have used the in-class flip and I started the in-class flip with my lowest learners because kind of like Bob, I decided, you know what, they're the ones not doing this crap that I give them at home anyway. So what am I losing? I'm actually gaining time with them if I can get them to do any of it. So um, in that case, not only did I gain back what I thought I might lose, I've gained and gained and gained because by detaching by detaching my due dates changing what's between my ears for them that really allowed them the opportunity to flourish so the in class flip worked really well the challenge with in class flip is you really kind of have to have that uh, lib you can do it you can build it as you go the first time but it's so much better once that library of material is there that you can just call on that it's there because it eliminates excuses. It also opens access to kids that have trouble with access to internet or who have unstable lives outside your classroom. And that is a great piece of the in-class flip. Uh, I was also answering some lesson planning uh, questions and they said, hey, how do you plan lesson plan? Flipping lesson plans are the bestest ever because again, once you have your content, you're going to put it in some sort of framework. So once you have your content, your lesson plans become a list of, oh, I'm going to grab this content piece for the student and this in-class activity here, and then this practice activity here, boo, 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 lesson plan done. And, and it works really nicely, but that takes a while to get to, which goes to one other question I had in here, guys. How long do you plan ahead for your videos? How long do you plan and think about what you're going to do for your videos? So what do you think, panel? I think for me, the, the actual planning of the videos depends on what style of video I'm doing. So as a math and mostly chemistry teacher, I, my style, honestly, is to do a lot of document camera watching me doing things on paper. Um, that's, that's my style of doing things. So I'm using usually a kind of handout that I previously we would have used in person in class you know just kind of doing the same lecture style where they would be watching me fill it in on the overhead or a document camera in class so i i usually have those resources already put together and it's just a matter of sitting down and doing it um, but if i'm going to do like a powerpoint based thing like I, I did a whole new powerpoint this year on significant figures such an exciting topic um, so i i did do a lot of preparing those slides but once i have it put together and i've done the video once i can generally reuse that with several groups of students and then they they look at how my hair length changes and which glasses I'm wearing from year to year but it is nice to be able to say oh hey I'm gonna have myself from three years ago teach this lesson today so that's kind of nice um, but the actual planning other than making the PowerPoint or the handout it isn't I don't find it's any different than planning for in class honestly because if I was making a PowerPoint for in class it would be the same um, but one thing I would say about lesson planning is that you one of the things that helps you avoid having students not watch the videos is you want to have your in-class activities tied very closely to the content that's in your videos. So you want there, there to be a reason for them to watch those videos, right? Um, and then I do try to to look at you know the the curriculum expectations that I'm trying to address. So it's always great to do that backwards design piece, right? What do you need them to be able to know and do? Based on that, what is content that you're going to deliver directly and what is things that you want them to be able to, to build skill wise. So anything that's content like lower level blooms, get it out of the classroom, put it in the video. Higher level stuff where you need them to integrate and, and apply and start creating and synthesizing, put that into your in class activities and say what is appropriate for this. Is it a lab? Is it some sort of jigsaw? Is it a research thing? So you're going to have um, you're, you're going to really tie your activity, whether it's in class space or, or, or individual space to the thing that they need to be able to accomplish. I hope that helps. Yeah, I just saw a question come in from Valerie about um, how does flipped classroom look in a physical education class. Um, I am not a physical education teacher, but my mom taught 
uh, elementary phys ed for a good 30 plus years. Um, but I used, I also coached swimming and I would use uh, flipped learning with my swimmers where I would shoot some video of them at practice uh, using my cell phone and then, um, or my iPad. Uh, there was an app I used called Swim Pro Plus, which was, um, I could do some like fun, um, you know, uh, slow motion within the video to slow it down, play it back for students, uh, for my swimmers. And I know TechSmith had uh, their Coach's Eye is another um, app that can be used for filming. So for phys ed, uh, what you would want to do is find some video that shows um, the activity that you're doing, the uh, technique, you know, of hitting the ball, of swimming the lap, create that video with the annotation with it, and then, you know, quizzing students, uh, formatively assessing them on the technique. And then you're asking them when they're in class or in practice to demonstrate those skills in person. So it, and this is the same for no matter what subject you're looking at. Look at the skills, get the skills on video for the students to watch, rewind, pause, rewatch again, check their understanding, and then have them within the classroom space and apply what they learned in the video. So I hope that helps to clarify things for you, Val Valeria. And I think that can apply to, I, I saw a question um, in a previous chat session about um, like in the arts. So if it's something like, you know, painting or sculpture or whatnot, you can show them a video of, hey, here's a technique. And then when they actually come to in class space, they're gonna practice using the technique instead of you having to, and you could even like do a video showing you doing the technique. And then when they come in, they're gonna practice using it. Matt. All right. Uh, and to tag off of Joy's, we had a great question, I think that would really go right in with the, the point you just made, Joy. How do we take that in-class flip and move it into a remote environment? Well, the answer is the key to the in-class flip is you have that safe, secure, stable classroom space where we can provide access, we can provide security. Unfortunately, that may not be a choice in, the, in this remote learning environment, but all of that content, all of that framework can be moved to that offsite for that student. And we're talking arts here. Uh, yesterday, Matt from Hawaii, which he's way asleep right now, okay? Um, but we're, we're talking about how do we do this with the arts? One thing that we don't highlight enough is we've been talking about us making content, us making videos, us doing stuff. Folks, flip the class. Students create, you want PE answers? No better way for a fifth grader to show how he's tying his shoes than him sending you the content, post it on Flipgrid, put it on the Edmodo, whoa, whoa, and then everybody can look at that and say, yay, Jimmy's got it, yay, Sue's got it, and, and you build it that way. Or for the arts, it's creation. That's the point of the arts share the creation you become the host you become the curator of your class museum in all its forms so don't get caught in the fact that flip means i create all the stuff if i one person have to do it all it takes forever but if you were showing me as a class what you can do now we got some winners so just a thought Oh, and Matt, and if you think about students creating videos, like in this remote learning environment that we're in, you know, families are going to be all together in their home spaces. This presents an opportunity to engage other family members within that process. So, you know, if they're sharing devices at home, uh, you know, one sibling is filming the other sibling doing the task, or, you know, if you have grandparents at home that, you know, a child can sync up with their um, their grandparent to say, or their parent to say, oh, look, this is how to push this button here. Let me teach you how to use this. And then we can do this together and learn the technology together to, to put things into play. Um, you know, our kids are, are pretty adaptable. And um, so as we think outside the box within our confined spaces that we're in, we can find ways to engage everybody in this learning process. And not to overwhelm you all with 
lots of apps and platforms and whatnot, but Flipgrid does come up a lot in terms of a, a great way to have students make video responses to a prompt that you give. And it's, it's pretty simple to use. So that's, I mean, you could, I, I'm saying don't check out all of the things, but Flipgrid is something that's worth checking out, especially in a remote environment. Uh, again, I have a question for everybody else because I'm having to use Flipgrid to flip our back to school night, our whole district and like welcome back open house night. They want to use Flipgrid. So if anybody has any thoughts uh, for real, I'm putting my email right over here in the chat. Hit me up uh, because like I needed this yesterday. So, all right. Thanks. Guys. This is about the new flippers. Not, not all about you. Come on. Yeah, Matt. But I will <laughs> add that um, Stacy Roshan, who's a pioneer in flipping, and I interviewed her for Ask the Flip Learning Network podcast last year, has been producing a whole bunch of videos over the last few months about Flipgrid. And I'd highly recommend checking out the work of Stacy Roshan. I'll link her Twitter as well as her YouTube here in a second. She's excellent. So there's been, I, I've been kind of watching the chat. There's been a lot of questions about videos, and I know that there was good information. Um, and, and how long it takes to go going back to creating that first set of notes. I, I, when I first started, cause you know, I started the week before school started, I took the notes that I had and just like I would usually I flipped through them to make sure they still applied to what I wanted to do this year, cleaned them up, cut out anything that was going to be, um, inner something that the students were going to have to work a little harder on. And I've kept that for the classroom. And I kept the copy down, the definitions, the concepts, equations, all of that introductory stuff, things that were going to take a while to write in the video. And then even then it was probably, you know, they probably, this is physics, it probably ranged um, eight to 10 minutes long for juniors in physics. It was on level, so it wasn't um, a, lot of, a lot of math. But because these were students who struggled in math, the math was very detailed. I mean, down to narrating exactly what I was doing in each step. And so when I went back through and, and redid it, I actually put those longer math pieces in a separate video because it was, um, I'd, I'd do some of the concepts and then I hadn't had one that had the, the math and gory detail. That way students who could do the math easily could fast forward through those pieces, but they kind of wanted to see it, but they could just kind of, Oh, I know, I know, I know, move through. But then they kind of, they still got the meat of the explanation of what the physics was behind the math in a separate video. And as I've been going along, I've, I've kept them more topical and more topical. So even if the topic is a tough one, like somebody was asking about photosynthesis um, or cellular respiration, I would break that down as far as you can into five to eight minutes because truth is, and, and you guys can all be, you know, think this on your own, when you were going through and looking at the pre-work and you opened one up and you were like, it's 45 minutes long, are you kidding me? Or it was, hey, this one's five minutes, I can knock this one out right now. Which one were you gonna pick? Just just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, because now, you might... Go ahead. So you, you might think that if you create like three five minute videos, it's the same as making a 15 minute video. It's not, it, it, it feels completely different and um, you'll get more. I remember I watched actually a series of posts that um, an experienced video maker had put up. He just had like, here's a one minute thing on something about making a video. And he had, I think six of them. And I sat down and clicked through every single one. Somebody called it, the, I think actually in that series, he called it the Game of Thrones effect, that you sit down and you say, oh, I want to watch the next one. I want to watch that. You just want to keep going with it. It's kind of like you're binge watching these mini videos. Whereas if you sat down and like, oh, what do you mean? It's like 50 hours long as opposed to 50 one hour episodes. It's, it feels very different. Um, but yeah, the other thing about something like cellular respiration or photosynthesis, now I'm, I'm a chemist, I'm not a biologist, but um, I have heard the idea of, again, think about the lower easiest to access content, put that into the video. And don't be, it doesn't mean that all of your lecture has to be outside of class time right? You could have them access the basics outside of class and then have them come in ready to have, say, a 10-minute lesson from you on something more complex. 
even in math, we can do that, right? So you get kind of the, the most basic example done through the video. And then when they come in, show them kind of the wrinkles where you might see something that you have to consider a little bit more in detail because you'll get more questions about the harder stuff. And even though you're, with whatever you do, you're going to have a way for them to ask you questions. The more complex stuff where they might need to ask it right away, maybe do that in class, right? So don't be afraid to, to mix delivery methods just because you're flipping to be flipped. Um, if we're ready to move on to another question, I saw one about uh, tips for special education teachers. So Katie, maybe you would be good for that. So um, tips for special education. So one, once again, I think I said this in a different thing, but special ed varies from, you know, the, the functional academics and life skills all the way up to the student with autism who's in your AP, all of your AP classes, or the student with high anxiety that's doing, that can't be in class, that's in a separate room, but still supposed to be attending your classes. So um, special ed's gonna look for those students is gonna look different. So you need, first you need to know your students and everybody's heard that a thousand times, but in this instance, you really need to know your students. Um, the, the, more, the more your students need personal attention, the more you're gonna to need to do the in-class flip. If you get down to the point where it's more of the functional academics or life skills, a lot of the flipping is for the parents. It's for communicating with the parents. It's so that they can know what kind of things they can do outside of school that can help re you can reinforce each other i mean so it's more of a communication piece here's what we did in class here's the you know the math lesson and matt could probably help a lot with this because he's got a lot of personal experience um, i've got probably more experience with the upper end um, the students with autism the students with adhd and things like that they love having those videos because i i remember you know the kid that can't sit in your classroom during note taking time cannot sit we'll go home have a snack eat his dinner and at nine o'clock at night he's okay to take his notes or maybe at seven o'clock in the morning a half an hour after the medication has kicked in and by two o'clock in the afternoon we're done we're done we're not doing it and he walks in and they're like you know what i'm not going to be able to take notes today or i can take notes but i need to be inside a cabinet yeah, that's really not a thing. Um, and and those are those are real things that have happened. So having having access to the notes when the students are actually ready is so, so huge. You know, you're not paying attention that day. Even the best, most attentive, no paperwork kid is gonna have a day where their brain is somewhere else and they're they're doodling and not getting the notes. So that if you're just lecturing, they missed it. They're not getting it and this way they've got it they've got it when they get home they've got it tomorrow they've got it before the test so yeah go ahead kate and then we'll let matt finish this up with his expertise yeah you bring up a really good point about uh parents you know when we think about the audience of our videos yeah our first you know as teachers we're going to think yeah our audience is going to be our students but really also our other audience is going to be our parents and i Oh, throughout this spring, my daughters um, were on remote learning. I have um, a sixth grader who just graduated sixth grade, and I have a eighth grader who is moving on now to ninth grade. But when I was trying to help my sixth grader with some of her concepts, like math, I'm just going to throw it out there. Sorry, math, ELA person right here. But I didn't understand the jargon. Like, what was the the terminology in this question and as I'm looking at it on paper I'm trying to figure out and to help her she's trying to explain it to me but it's a disconnect because I was missing a really key piece of information from the teacher so if I had the as a parent was able to watch a video that the teacher created that was that direct instruction it could have helped inform me to assist my my child as we're working together so um, the more that we can use flipped learning as a communication for everyone, all of everybody that's involved with learning, uh, the more successful we can be. Matt. Uh, well, uh, you know, Katie works at it from a professional side. I'm a professional educator and a professional dad to a nonverbal cerebral palsy child. And my daughter last Christmas got a 65 inch television for Christmas for her because that's her way of interacting with people. 
Um, it's not because, I mean, I'd like to use the big TV, but it's, it's hers. It's her stuff. I can't use it. Um, but it's, Katie is right. The, the special, in the special education situation, just like the elementary school, the younger we go, okay, or the more we need to include special circumstances, whether it's learning disability, emotional issues, social issues, um, you know, emotional supports, all of these, the more flip learning becomes a triangle rather than a two-way relationship. It absolutely needs to be teacher, parent, student, because the question that every person that's ever had an elementary school kid has is, how did the teacher tell you to do this? What were you supposed? I don't know. And you're like, why don't you know? Weren't you there today? And, and I don't know. And if you just have a quick 30 second, 40 second, 50 second video that goes, uh, like, seriously, that's it? That's what you didn't? Okay, all right. And or if in a special education situation, you have that physical therapist that is performing the stretch or whatever it is that you're supposed to be working with with that child. Or here's our sorting activity. Normally when we do our Emma sorting activity, I use three little buckets and I use the colored dots and, and you go, okay, I can do that. I can go get me some Tupperware. I can get me some clothespins or whatever. I don't know, does anybody ever actually have clothespins that are not for art projects anymore? Um, but <laughs> you live in Mexico, that's not fair, Ken. Um, but, you know, it's communication. And Kate is 100% correct. It's, it's this three-way environment. And in special education, it's demonstration. But I have a great special education teacher that teaches that life skills class. For her, again, it's not so much about sending video out as it is getting video back. Because Alex loves making his videos. And Brian has his channel. And, and they're psyched because somebody's listening to them. And that's if we can get people, if we can get students to feel like somebody's listening to them, we have achieved whatever goal we had set out. And the, I, I did have a chance to go with a special ed group on a, a field trip. And one of the things it was a, it was the functional academics class. So these are some students that are probably, you know, high school students that are age six or less functioning wise. Um, and they, they loved making the videos of what they did that day, you know, cause I, I started make, taking pictures and making videos. And, and once we did, we did all that, we put it together for them. They love seeing those videos and talking. You got, we got more talking about what was happening while they were watching the videos. Oh, so-and-so did this. Oh, so-and-so did that. That's when I did this. And they weren't saying any of that while we were on the trip. So you didn't know if they were getting anything at all out of it. But then afterwards in that reflect, we had an inadvertent reflection piece with some students that we never expected to have a reflection piece with because we used some of the tools and it was just fortuitous. So, you know, those kind of things, once you start playing with, with the tools that you use for flipping, they're going to pop up in some unexpected, wonderful places too. And, and so even if, even if you're not ready to d dive in and, and, you know, just flip everything like, you know, I did, Bob did, you know, it's like, you know, just first class go, it's really okay. Pick some times when you think this would be the most amazing thing. It's, it's a great place to do it. There was a question about um, how often do you use videos created by other folks? And, um, you know, in my bio class, I made those, but when it came to AP bio, uh, it was the, I just started teaching it three years ago and um, I use totally other people's stuff. <laughs> so my kids want me to start making videos for that class and I haven't, uh, haven't started yet, but soon, but, but for the last three years, I've been just using some other teachers' videos. I, 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 well, I started so long ago, there weren't that many choices. It, Khan Academy had just started and it was too high level for what we were doing. Um, and so I, in order to find a video that would have worked with the right content and the right level, it would have taken me hours and weeks to curate that. 
And I came to the point where, well, I guess I have to make my own. Because there was, oh, just use videos that are out there. They're not out there. They weren't out there. And that may, depending on what you teach, they may not be out there. But now I, now I can use a combo where I have enough of mine, I'm fine. But also, every once in a while, somebody's got a much better setup for handing calculus and the production value is better and clearer. Or, or perhaps they have a unique way of pronouncing words that makes it en at least entertaining while the entire topic is a complete bore. Those are the ones that I'll put up rather than watch me try to wrangle through a calculus problem. Um, and so it's a mix now, really, the best of kind of series. Yeah, and you think too about um, what is the intent, the purpose of the video? Like, yeah, it's to disseminate content, it's to you know do direct instruction, but it's also to build connection. You know, uh, that when we show our faces in the little, you know, camera in camera on um, with some of the tools, you know, we might, you know, we're not going to be Hollywood. We don't have our hair done and our makeup done, but that's okay because it's about looking in the eye and seeing each other. That like, as we're filming, if we look at the camera, it's as if we can make eye contact with our students, our audience, and that they can hear our voice, they can see our face, we can do our movements, um, you know, wear a silly hat or even have the dog get featured. You know, I can't tell you how many times since I made a video, they were like, where's the dog? I wanna see the dog. If that's the gimmick to get them to watch, okay, come on in. But it builds that sense of connection. And that's what we also wanna do with the videos. It's not about yeah. replacement, it's about connection through the script. Totally. John, John Thomas Palmer talk point. about that as well, definitely later today. I'm gonna to jump on that point that Kate made because I do find with some of my earlier videos, one drawback of them is that I, I just sit there like I'm talking to myself and it's very monotonous and it's honestly boring. So I've had to really put myself in the mindset of, okay, I'm the person on the other, there's a person on the other side there, that's my class, I'm talking to them and just pretending like I'm talking to somebody in class, but taking out, one way to, to reduce the length is take out those, those pregnant pauses that we're so used to having as teachers, right? Where you say something and you pause for them to think about it you don't need that in the video right they can pause it themselves if they need to think about it so it, it does come get into a different mindset but yeah just <laughs> try to be interesting when you talk right there's a picture your your student on the other side of that camera and you know you're teaching you know so and so and just pretend that you're having a conversation with them and it will actually i did see uh, I think maybe you made this point that where you standing up can actually add to your energy instead of sitting down and I never would yet I never would have thought of that so that is something where I am going to need to grow right yeah so thank you for that point so now I'm like I need a standing desk how can I improve this setup I sent you links uh, there Joy I know I'll, you did I'll add thank on you to for that, that. Um, Sean Michael Morris uh, Critical Digital Pedagogy, and I interviewed him as well, says, speak through the screen. Don't speak at the screen. You gotta be speaking to your students on the other side, and you really need to emphasize your energy because the energy gets lost in video. You just gotta be like over the top energetic and take a look at the work of um, ah, Michael, who I linked earlier, and I actually published my video that's going out right now. Um, some ex Michael Wesh. Michael Wesh's videos are excellent about this, and he's done some recent work about how he's going to do things in the fall with videos and online education. Right. So, any more questions? And Cynthia just asked if you can do voiceover with Screencast-O-Matic or if Edpuzzle is better for that. Um, do any of you use Screencast-O-Matic? Okay, can you do voiceover with Screencast-O-Matic? I know with that puzzle, it's easy. Like you just say, here's a video and you just rip out the audio and you can record right over it. But then the video stays in Ed puzzle, right? Like the students have yeah. to access it that way. And you got to be careful about rights there, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, yes, get the Ken reading. But um, one thing about Screencast-O-Matic is you have to understand that there is the screencasting component. There's the screen capture component. And then there's the editing component. And it's in the editing component that you can add the voiceover stuff 
Um, and then you can download it or either to their hosting site or you can download it MP4 or whatever file type you want. It's not as powerful as a full on video editor. It's just not. But, but you can hack it, Matt, because you can you can screencast yourself watching the video and talking while you're watching the video and pausing the video. I mean, you can right. do a meta level recording. It's not it's not that yes. tricky, actually. Yeah, just be I careful mean, with rights. Right. <laughs> so, but the, the point is whether you do it all what I call in camera, like Ken right. was talking about, or whether you do it in post with an application, uh, it can be accomplished. And Screencast-O-Matic has some of those things. By the way, as that's I'm halfway done with that video edit. It's our conversation with Christine Umayam of Screencast-O-Matic, one of our uh, people that is a friend of the network. And uh, we'll have that released as well, as well as take a look at the one we just released yesterday for Zach Korzik and Delta Math. If you're not familiar with that, we talked to the CEO and founder. We have Play Posit coming up next week. We had Kim Sabria of Edpuzzle, founder and president. We had our conversation released earlier this week with him. And I'm forgetting somebody, but that's okay. There's a great podcast with Jonathan Palmer Thomas that Ken put out yesterday as well. So, but yeah, Screencast-O-Matic, you can usually make it work. I'm advertising for EduCoffee, which basically starts now. And so oh. I'm going to drop off and start my EduCoffee. Uh, it's my way of staying sane and hanging out with people uh, once a day at 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. my time when I'm not teaching. And uh, I think it's a real important thing to talk about uh, our mental and emotional health. And that's a thing I've been doing since the 25th of March. And that webpage has information. If you want the uh, hall pass to get in, you need to ask me privately because I don't advertise it to try to avoid the Zoom bombing. And I'm going to go ahead and put up our the Twitter, the our names and the Twitter information. Thank you, Ken. Have fun. Bye. Um, that way, you guys, if you have other questions or you want to con make contact, connect with folks during this, um, dur during the conference, work together. It's We're remote anyways. Work with each other. Find people that are teaching like things or want to try something that you want to try and, and make those contacts. And then I'm going to put that screen back up, assuming I can find it. If you don't have... A Twitter account. I, I have found that Edu Twitter is a much more supportive part of Twitter than some parts. I mean, you hear about celebrities getting attacked and whatnot on Twitter, but I've never found Edu Twitter to be anything but supportive. And when I say Edu Twitter, it's just Twitter. It's just educators talking to each other on it. It's not some sort of special section. But if you have a question and you put like the hashtag flip class on it, it might take a couple of days, but usually somebody will see that and, and respond to your questions. So don't be afraid to jump in that way. It's uh, that way you get people from all over the world who are flipping, not just the one person that you might email. And, and if you have a, a question that you want to want to turn into a flip class chat, I guarantee uh, Matt, Joy, and I would love to do that. Just let us know what your questions are and we can turn that into topics and then you can show up and be part of the chat and learn some things that are specifically geared to you. Because honestly, we do randomly run out of uh, topics all the time and, and would love some extra help. Or if you feel like you want to jump in and moderate, we we'll talk to you about that too so and that is yeah. monday nights monday nights is twitter uh flip class chat oh i got i got flip tech 2020 like i've said it a bajillion times this week but flip class chat um also make sure you take a look at the schedule because basically this is the first session of about a 10 hour run mm -hmm. or uh that's going to last all the way in through the evening of great great stuff so take a look, I believe in one hour, Chris Baker is up next and then we just keep on rolling. Let's see, Honey has a question, I think. Uh, um, well, it's, it's not really a question. I'm just, I'm not sure that I can uh, catch up with the panel discussion. It's gonna be 3 a.m. at my time. <laughs> so I don't know where am I gonna be that, at that time. But I just wanna say for you guys, uh, thanks a lot. It's been it's been a fantastic uh, experience, and all the effort in uh, conducting this conference, and the experience to the opportunity to connect with everyone. So, big thumbs up and keep it up. And uh, it's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you for being part of it. It has been a lot of fun, hasn't it? Yeah, next, 
if if I can if I can give like um, a recommendation that I would give if I attended the panel discussion, please. It would, it, it would be nice if I mean this conference is called teaching that works in 2020, right? So given all these diverse uh, presentations and talks, it would be nice to have like a statement, like a one-page statement or something like recommendations given the special times we are about to enter, we are in and then who knows what's gonna happen in the next semester, right? So, I mean, it would be nice to have like a statement of recommendations or like general stuff that grasp from all the talks that have been given over the five or six days past. Just a suggestion. Awesome. And Katie, did you, did you hear that? Cause my internet bleeped out there. Yeah. So kind of a, so honey, if, if I understood you right, it was kind of big ideas, topics, things that we think, things that we all learned. Is that what yeah, you're like, 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 like take home, like general statements or take home messages from, from the conference as a whole. I mean, ah. we know each, a big, a big reflection piece. Yeah, something like that. Each presentation, of course, has its own, you know, objective, take-home messages. But mm -hmm. it would be nice to have something an overall from the whole conference. Um, just maybe to, we could just talk. maybe we could like crowdsource a document, like make a Google Doc that all the attendees can yeah, you know, well, contribute your big takeaway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and the reflection be... piece that uh, Helene yeah. had us do at the end of her sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be Super. good. Thank you. Idea. All right. I guess if anybody else have anything there, Matt. I can... think I think that's it. Uh, again, uh, hour there, from now, Chris. Yeah, there was there was a final question about assessment. I don't know if we have time to kind of throw something in there about that. Oof. Uh, that's a big topic. Um, well, that's yeah, student assessment. That's huge. So, is there something specific? About yeah, if, if uh, Roxanne, if you'll throw something a little more specific, we can maybe address that. I just was thinking on a period of uh, in a class. So how do you assess at the same time that you send your videos and then you are uh, next day talking to uh, having a discussion with your students? Um, how would you assess that everybody's in the same page? So oh, actually, things. Katie had a session about that. So um, I think, Katie, your, your pre-work actually addresses that really nicely. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, quick quiz is the my my thing is the easiest for me to digest. So, um, one or two questions per objective, and you know, do you, do you understand the what the con the topic, the objective? Do you understand the words? Do you understand the definition? You know, and then the next question was, can you use it? And so from that, you can glean, you know, where the students are. Did they get the information they needed? Are they ready to get using it? And then if everybody's at the same place, your class can move on to the really great application pieces. If there's some that are lost in the, I don't even know how to use it yet piece, then, then you've got some that are ready to move on. You've got some that you're gonna have to work a little bit on the, I'm not quite ready, you know, back up a little bit, review that a little bit. And then if you've got some that are like, I don't even know, you can be, okay, did you even watch that? Were you? Looking at the did you play the sound for the video? Because I know we say watch, but we should always kind of say and listen, watch right. and listen because they'll play it and they're listening. They're they're still doing other things. So you know there's there's some verb pieces in there, but um, just a couple quick questions. Sometimes I would put in a little. I I started with a the Google form that would have maybe you know two questions per objective. Um, and I could tell, and I, I always included the things that were historically, I know these kids aren't gonna get this. And the first few times I did it was to clear up, is it my imagination? Is it the way I'm teaching it? Or is it just, it's something that we really have to plan to go over in class again. They need to hear it three times and get a chance to process it and play with it with their fingers before they even get it. But I still want them to see it, it's exposure. And I always looked at that video not as a mastery piece. It was exposure. I'm exposing you to this information. Get what you can out of it. I do not expect you to really learn from it. I mean, I expect you to bring this material and this information into class 
and we're going to learn more together. We're going to use it. We're going to do it because you've got parents that'll say, how is my child? Why don't I just sit them in front of PBS and make them learn? Because it doesn't work that way. They need to use it and learn it. And that's what we're doing in class. Great. So that, that's my take on that. So assessing is you can, add, you can do a quick, um, one of the, the bell ringer, a couple questions. Well, how's everybody doing? Double check. You can do it as a Google form. I have learning management system that I can build it in. I put the video up. It's the header for a quiz. They take the quiz. They can go back and forth through the video. I put um, mine. I put those types of questions at the very end of the video in Edpuzzle. And I, that before I start class, I take a look at how they, the class responded and I'll know if I need to reteach or not, but, but Katie's right. They're not le necessarily learning. They're getting the, the vocabulary and stuff, but they're really going to do the learning in the classroom then. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Got a, got a smaller, we're in a small group session now. So you guys can, you know, turn on your mics and ask questions and have conversations. You got, we, we probably lost 10 years of flipping experience, but I think we make up for a couple more here and there with the names that I'm seeing. So I'll still claim 50 years of, of flipping experience here. Anybody else, anything? Ashley, you have anything? This is your chance. All right, guys, I got to go prep. Wait, Ash, for, oh, you're leaving, Matt? Well, I'm, I'm actually, I can't leave till y'all do, so. No, never mind. You, can't, I'll just sit you, here. Can make, you can make me host if you want. Okay, you but what, will the recording cut off at this point? Um, I, think if you, uh, I think if you're host, yeah, you can cut the recording off. It's okay. All right, sounds good. Make Thanks, me guys. Host and you can end the recording. How's that? <laughs>